Next, we're going to head to the south and west to the well-known and highly traveled west coast of Arizona and the beaches of the mighty Colorado River. Um, the region, of course, is slightly less traveled than the central and eastern parts of Arizona, but it's full of some amazing habitats and some really iconic species. And our tour guides here are going to be Val Morrill and her uh, collaborator, Karen Reichardt. And they've both had a lifelong love of plants, which um, has led them into their careers. They were both professionally engaged in conservation and in land management within the federal government. Val retired from the BLM as a land management specialist, and Karen worked for the Army as a conservation officer. They both volunteer in the Yuma community, and tonight they are going to introduce us to Living the Vida Flora on Arizona's West Coast. So grab your sunglasses and your beach towel and let's go. <laughs> so Lynn, I was actually hoping you were gonna do what you were supposed to do and sing, and it's Living La Vida Flora on Arizona's West Coast. I'm glad I didn't. Uh... <laughs> uh, Karen and I both are really thrilled to be here and be a part of the um, Botany Meeting 2020. We'd like to, uh, you know, acknowledge the assistance we re received from Nancy Meister, who's a member of the Yuma chapter, and Rebecca Peck and John Anderson, who um, were assisting us with the northern part of the west coast of Arizona. So um, just to give you kind of uh, what we hope to talk about is uh, we're going to give kind of an introduction to our area uh, and then a floral tour taking you to some botany hotspots we, we appreciate. Uh, tell you about some natives we think would work in your home landscaping if you're out on this uh, harsher part of Arizona, where you have a chance to locate them, which is kind of a challenge and where you can learn more. Just to get you a quick introduction to Western Arizona, we're calling it the three uh, counties that you can see there, Mojave, La Paz, and Yuma. What these counties represent is like a fifth of Arizona's land mass, but only about 6% of the population. And it truly is a land of contrast and extremes. Uh, basin and range physiography, as has been mentioned, uh, we are representative of three of the four North American deserts, only missing the Chihuahuan. Uh, but especially what makes us unique, I believe, is this oasis factor of the rivers, reservoirs, lakes, and marshes that are in our part of Arizona. Uh, and then just to give a little more idea about the contrast, the uh, elevation can range as low as 72 feet down in the very, you can see the little arrow down in the corner of San Luis, Arizona, and then as high as 8,417 feet at Hualapai Path. Peak. And then the precip can average as low as three and as high as 11 inches annually. So, just because Karen and I are from Yuma, we wanted to actually give you some more factoids about us in particular. Um, it is a junction of two major rivers, the Colorado and the Gila. We have the longest growing season in the U.S. of 350 days as far as agriculture. And we are the winter lettuce capital and the medjool date capital of the world here in Yuma. Uh, as been mentioned, we're the hottest and driest subdivision of the Sonoran Desert. And we are number one in the U.S. for most 100 degree days per year. This morning we were up to 137 for year 2020. We have the least average annual precip and we're number one for hours of sunshine per year at 4,300 hours. Also want to mention that the Gran Desierto, the Yuma area is sort of the northern extent of the largest sand sea in North America. Well, it's time for me to turn this over to Karen Reichardt and let me get ready here. Okay, take it away, Karen. All right, put on your field hats, get your binoculars, your sunglasses, uh, we're going to take you on a tour. We're going to go botanizing. And first of all, we looked at the biotic communities of the southwestern U.S. And we realized with these red check marks that are on the screen, we have in our three counties, nine of the 12 biotic communities, the terrestrial ones. And we also have 
extensive riparian and that's along the Colorado River primarily, and then the Bill Williams River. And the other thing, we've talked about climate in a lot of the other presentations, and I just wanna let you realize that also we've got kind of a quadrant here. It's a, a very specialized zone from cold climates in the north to hot in the south, and then we've got the influence of the, Mogi, of the monsoon from the east and then the winter Pacific storms. And we, especially down in Yuma, but also even up in the Kingman area, we get the tail end of both of those climatic regimes. Okay, so we chose six sites, actually even more, to botanize. And um, this is La Vida Flora of the West Coast. We're gonna go from Mount Trumbull, the Arizona Strip, the Dolan Springs and Meadview area, Kofu National Wildlife Refuge, the Gila Mountains and the Tanaha Saltas, and representatives of the Gran Desierto, and then we're gonna hit the riparian. First off, our highest elevations are in the northern part, the northern parts of Mojave County, and we've got Mount Trumbull and Wallapai Peak. And Mount Trumbull is composed of volcanic soil and volcanic rock. And so the soils are poor. And at the top, around 8,029 feet, is a ponderosa pine, solely ponderosa pine. But um, Wallapai Peak is different because it's basin and range province. It's more granitic soil. And at the peak, um, we have uh, a mixed conifer forest. Okay, um, so in this slide, we just wanna show you some representative montane conifer forest native plants. And um, uh, that little pocket of north facing slope plants on the top of Wallapai Peak has quaking aspen, white fir, Douglas fir, and ponderosa pine. There's also we looked at the flora, at, we built a checklist of the flora and we found this one dark red onion, which we wanted to point out. It's the lowest range extension, the furthest south range extension of that plant. And um, the rest of the populations are up north in California primarily. So, and then as you go down, there's 4,000 acres of ponderosa pine at lower elevation. There's some very tall specimens of Gamble's oak and then uh, the lower reaches of the wallapais have um, interior chaparral, which we learned about just previously. So stamp your passport. I forgot to tell you there's passports here. Stamp your passport and uh, we're taking you way up north to the Great Basin scrub. The Great Basin reaches its southern extent up on the Arizona Strip. And we just wanted to highlight where um, on this map, it shows from St. George down to the Grand Canyon, and these are all places where botanists have collected it and uh, collected the Artemisia tridentata, big sage, which is the um, dominant species of the whole Great Basin. And here's a close up of big sage, Artemisia tridentata. Big sage has had, it's been a hard hit community. It's um, influenced with grazing, cheatgrass, wildfire, and it's a plant community at risk. It's also got some very important species that are at risk. Um, and so we just wanted to point it out. If you want to go to the, the um, Great Basin, this is a great place to go. So now we're going to take you to the Mojave Desert. You can stamp your passport. Um, we chose two sites, Mead View and Dolan Springs and Gold Basin. Um, you can find these place names on an Arizona road map. They're easy places to get to and you can botanize um, right off the road. And Joshua Tree is um, considered the dominant species of the, um, the Mojave Desert. Mojave Desert is warmer than the Great Basin, but it's got cooler temperatures than farther south in the Sonoran Desert. 
Um, also, what I learned recently doing this talk, I learned that while Joshua tree appears to be the dominant species, it actually occurs in plant communities that are composed of a lot of other different species that are actually more dominant. So here we have some representative plants, although um, I learned that fairy duster, we, we thought it would be a representative one, but it actually occurs more south, but it's a plant that would be wonderful. Our, our friends in Kingman said it would be a really wonderful plant to plant in the Kingman area. Um, in the middle, we have Mojave yucca, and then on the right, we have Joshua tree, representative of the Mojave Desert. Okay, now if you look at the X on the map, we're going to take you down into the Sonoran Desert. And uh, the transition as you travel from the Mojave Desert to the Sonoran Desert, you're going to find a big mix. And sometimes it's hard to tell which desert you're in. Obviously, you're, you're traveling in between the deserts. But um, in some places, you'll find Joshua Tree and Saguaro in the same locality. The saguaros tend to be up on the hillsides and the Joshua trees are more in the, the lower. But now, um, where we're taking you now, where the X is, is in Kofa National Wildlife Refuge. And this is a favorite playground for us Yuma folks. Um, there are miles and miles of off-road uh, trails. You've gotta be prepared. You've gotta have your four-wheel drive um, or at least high clearance. But in this slide, we have three locations. On the top left is horse tanks in the Castle Dome Mountains. And then in the middle, we sh we're showing a group of um, botanists, naturalists who are at Palm Canyon, which is a, definitely a favorite destination in the Kofas. And then on the right is King Valley, which is a huge, broad, Valley. So one of the unique things, unique things about the Kofas is that, the, well, the Kofa National Wildlife Refuge is in the valley floor, you've got the lower Colorado River Valley subdivision of the Sonoran Desert and these big expanses of desert pavement, which we totally love. They're really wonderful to explore. And then in the uplands, in the mountains, you've got the um, Arizona uplands with saguaro, Palo Verde. And then if you can make it in your four-wheel drive to the higher elevations, there's some ranch land, some, it's no longer being grazed, but it's got tobosa grass, large extensive, extensive stands of tobosa. And I think the botanizing at the COFA is, it, it's just, we haven't even begun to really botanize there. So, here are some unique and rare plants from the Kofas. We've got another Allium, Parrish's Wild Onion. It grows not every year, but it grows in, on the hill slopes in the mountains. Then we've got, and it is the southernmost population, and the other populations are farther north in, I think a little bit in the Grand Canyon area, and then again in California. Um, and then Kofa Mountain Barberry is a very unique plant. It's found in the Kofas and in the Organ Pipe Cactus National Monument. And then on the right is Palm Canyon. These are the palms of Palm Canyon. And uh, these are famous. People come to, from all over to see these palms. They're the only native palms in Arizona. The, again, um, the other native palms are over in California. And I've just found um, this huge trend with so many of the plants that we think are really neat and fun to botanize in Western Arizona are more common over in California and they don't um, go eastward into the Arizona uplands of, of uh, Arizona. Now we're taking you way down south the X at the bottom right on the border is the Tinaja Saltas. And that's shown, the two slides on the, or the two photos on the right are um, the Tinaja Saltas. And those are a granitic outcrop, which is really important for what types of plants 
unusual plants are found there. And then the slide to the left, the photo to the left is Telegraph Pass area, which is in the Gila Mountains, and that's metamorphic rock. And the Gila Mountains can be accessed from Interstate 8. They're the playground of Yuma. There's a trail that goes from 400 ele feet elevation at the bottom to about 1,200 feet at the top. There's wonderful botanizing in the canyons. And then the Tinaja Saltas, even though it's farther south, it starts at elevation 1,000 feet at the floor. So down south here in the Sonoran Desert, we've got a lot of influence from the subtropics in our plants. We wanted to feature elephant tree. Elephant tree grows in a lot of different places in Arizona, but if you come to Yuma, you're gonna see some huge elephant tree. And um, the photo on the right is down on the Berry Goldwater. You have to get a permit from the military to go down there. And this is a gigantic elephant tree and there's a Nagavi desert eye in the shade that um, I think might have been ancient from people putting it there. But um, we also have a special project with Dr. Irv Barnes, who's local here in Yuma, one of our um, Yuma chapter members, and he's studying the flower morphology of the elephant tree. All right, some notable plants from the Gila Mountains. We've got two cacti that have similar range distributions, the many-headed barrel, which is a relict, Mojave relict, and it's found in the Gila Mountains and the Lechuguilla Plain, right around Yuma. And then the um, beaver tail cactus has a similar distribution, but it's far more common. And it doesn't look this beautiful very often because when you only have sometimes even, you know, like a quarter of an inch of rain in, in a whole year, it looks terrible. And then when it does come out, it looks gorgeous. And then on the right, we have this Sonoran silver bush, which is uh, really interesting. It, it grows only in the Gila Mountains right around Yuma, and then it's distributed down in Baja. And there, there are a lot of other plants in the Yuma area that are like that, where they only occur in the Yuma area and then you'll find them in Baja. So um, Kearney Sumac, Wendy mentioned it yesterday, that's a tree that grows in the Tanaha Saltas in the granite. Um, and then we've got Thurber stem sucker in the Gila Mountains. It's a tiny, tiny little parasite and it's in a plant family, the Refles yaceae, that also has the largest flower in the world. And then to the right is smoke tree, which is also confined to the Western Arizona area in the washes and then over in California. Now we're gonna take you to the dunes and uh, you can't go botanizing in our area and not go to the dunes. They're just too spectacular. Um, on the right photo, we have a Yuma chapter botanizing trip. We went over to the Imperial Sand Dunes last spring. One of the plants we saw was the uh, Laria tridentata variety arenaria. Some people say it's really not a variety, but it's a variety of creosote bush that grows tall, as you can see. Uh, lots of other things to botanize there. And then the Mohawk Dunes is accessible on Interstate 8. And um, the photo on, in the middle just shows you a representation of what the dunes can look like when we get a lot of soil moisture, a lot of rain, lots of gorgeous flowers. And um, the Gran Desierto, the largest sand sea in North America, is just to the south of us. And these dunes are really an extension of that. We have some representative sand loving native plants, the dune sunflower, the ajo lily, the blue sand lily, which has two population areas, a pretty extensive population area in Yuma and in the sand dunes on the Mesa, and then the Pinta sands in the Cabeza Prieta. And then it's fairly common down in Baja. So again, this is another example. 
And then sand food, which is an endemic that's restricted to the imperial sand dunes and the Barry Goldwater, um, the sand dunes to the south. We have these tremendous Colorado River habitats. This is a photo uh, in the 1900s of the Cottonwood Gallery Forest. We have extensive marshlands and riparian habitat. Bureau of Reclamation has planted 3 million cottonwood trees in mitigation. You got to see it. It's spectacular. Um, Yuma has planted, gosh, over 500 acres of cottonwood and willow just because the city wants to get in on the riparian restoration too. And they're spectacular. And then we have some notable natives. And again, these are pretty much restricted to our area and then California. I'm gonna turn it back over to Val and thank you very much. We were asked to, uh, uh, to come up with plants we'd recommend people to be able to plant in their home landscaping. And of course, for us, the first thing is wolfberries, wolfberries, wolfberries. They make a, a great uh, shrub type plant for using for passive solar or privacy screening. And the best part is they have a magnificent berry, the taste of which has been described as smart tomato, part bell pepper, and a shot of sugar. Uh, if you get a good one. Sometimes they're not so tasty. But uh, one that I'd recommend that berry is highly nutritious. It's related to the goji berry we play to pay too much money for at the health food store. These are just some others that would be most likely available. The uh, desert marigold, one that would be available as seed. On occasion, we're fortunate to be able to get our local milkweed, which a rush milkweed, also known as ajomete, um, which uh, is available as a small plant to start with. Uh, and then the chuparosa, or hummingbird plant, all three of these are important for wildlife. So where can we get these in our part of Arizona? And unfortunately, we're maybe fortunate to is most often you're gonna be able to get the artistic versions of the live plants instead of the actual plants. But we did come up with a few things that would help people if they wanted to go native. And uh, one up in the Northern half um, is the Des Destination Forever Ranch and Gardens that are outside of Yucca, Arizona. We have a couple of nurseries that uh, mostly have cacti, but do have sometimes shrubs or other plants native and that's the classy cactus in Yuma Nursery. Uh, most of us, though, we wait for the Yuma Home and Garden Show or one of the Master Gardeners uh, projects that uh, have native plants. We're very fortunate in that we have a full-size commercial uh, greenhouse that's going to be devoted for native plant growing and, and uh, distribution. Just some resources to get a, help you get acquainted. The main thing I'd recommend, of course, is getting with us as at the uh, Native Plant Society chapter. And then the Extension Service here has a whole cadre of master gardeners that you can contact and ask for assistance and the master gardener will be on the way to assist. So thank you for joining us on a virtual journey of the uh, West Coast of Arizona, and hope you can come visit us again. Thank you very much, and adios. Thanks so much, Karen and Val. That was really fun. Uh, and I, you, know, you really opened my eyes to some wonderful habitats out there. I'm gonna have to get some time to get out there. We have a few questions for you. Um, and so one of them is about the, the Joshua trees that um, you mentioned are in La Paz County. Are those the Western or the Eastern species, one of our people wants to know. Yes, I don't know. I looked on Signet. It was new to me. I, I really don't know enough about Joshua Tree. I'd have to refer that to Wendy. Okay. Well, Wendy actually asked the next question, which is <laughs> what species is that cool dark purple onion with the southernmost distribution? Is that the maybe the same as you what you call dark red onion? Yes. Allium atro rubens. Okay. Um, and there were a couple other requests for names of plants. The name of the tall creosote? Laria tridentata. And then in sign it, it says variety arenarium. But 
Val pointed out when we were on our field trip that they think now that it really is not a variety. It's, it's, it's uh, well, maybe it is a variety, but it's only found in the imperial sand dunes. So if you look in Sinet at, at, for that variety, you will find locations where you can go. I, I think it's a different growth form based on trying to grow in sand is what I've heard. Yeah, the subspecies name or the variety name suggests that. And Wendy, right. Wendy has answered. She says the Joshua tree in La Paz is Yagariana, Yagariana, the eastern one. Okay, the Jager, Jager's version. Yagariana, okay. Yeah. Um, another question was the name of the smoke tree. The smoke, um, smoke tree. Sorothamnus. Is it um, Spinoza? Was it the question Spinoza. for the tree? Sor yes. Uh, Spinoza's. Yeah. Sorothamnus Spinoza's. Okay. P S O R O, Sorothamnus. Okay. And our last question is which wolfberry species has the best tasting berries? <laughs> I just keep chewing on berries until I find <laughs> one I like. <laughs> It's usually dangerous. <laughs> well, not Macrodon. It is the ugliest that you'll ever find. But I would say Lycium fremontii. Yeah. I found oh, patches of Lycium fremontii that look like they were planted hedgerows that some Native Americans must have planted along the Gila River. But that would be my preference. Okay, that's great. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave the Vita Flora behind and move on. But thank you very much, ladies, for a really fun presentation. We appreciate your contribution.